connection uh, with Thailand. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with, with a little bit of an overview uh, on Thailand and the regulatory framework concerning foreign direct investment here. I will then lead on to uh, one of the uh, well, the most popular um, method of foreign uh, direct investment here in Thailand, uh, the business promotion by the Board of Investment, and will then uh, lead to the specific uh, topic of the Eastern Economic Corridor, uh, a special investment zone which the government has uh, targeted for uh, investment with special incentives. Uh, the talk today will be an introductory level talk, so I hope there will be some viewers uh, with us who are not in Thailand and at the moment and may find this interesting. Uh, for everybody uh, who is already in Thailand, um, uh, well, maybe you can take uh, something out of it, um, but it will be quite high level introductory. Bettina, can you please go to the next slide? So here, just a quick overview uh, of uh, Thailand uh, has a, a population of uh, 67 million. The median age is uh, 39 years old. This is uh, quite a bit older than many other ASEAN countries. Then again, a little bit younger than the average uh, age in Europe. We have a workforce of around uh, 39 million and currently around uh, 38 million people employed. That means we have an unemployment rate of 2% now. Uh, traditionally, the rate in Thailand is, uh, has been always very low, mostly 1% or even lower. Now with the COVID surge, it's gone up to 2%, uh, but this figure has to be seen with some caution as a lot of employment in Thailand is actually in the informal sector and the government cannot easily track unemployment uh, for these people. Um, the gross wage level at the moment is around 400 euros or 15,000 baht per month. And we have a GDP per uh, capita of around 7,800 US dollars. Total GDP, 543 billion US dollars. Now, economic growth in Thailand throughout the last uh, couple of years has been healthy, although not on the level uh, as we've seen in some other ASEAN country, around 3% to 4%. It's been gone down a little bit uh, to just over 2%, 2.4% in 2019. And now with the COVID pandemic, we have seen uh, a huge decline and we're now uh, looking at uh, negative growth of around 6%, decline of around 6% for the year of uh, 2020. Uh, it's been forecasted that this will uh, um, we go back into the positive area of around plus three percent next year or this year in 2021. Um, at the moment, we're just seeing a new wave of COVID cases in Thailand, and the government has put uh, the part of the com part of the country in a lockdown. And um, a lot of industries, specifically, of course, the tourist industry, hotels, restaurants, are suffering very heavily also from the travel restrictions that Thailand has at the moment. So uh, I'm unfortunately not too optimistic for the year of 2021, um, but uh, we'll see, we hope for the best of course with the vaccines now starting in many countries and soon hopefully also in Thailand. Next slide, please. Yeah, how has this um, 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 been reflected in the foreign direct investment. You can see here a slide uh, from the BOI. Uh, the report was only available in Thai, so I've just uh, put in some translations here. Um, for 2020, uh, the first three quarters are only reported. So we compare this here with the first three quarters of 2019, which is the middle um, column here. Uh, you can see that the number of investment projects, uh, 665 uh, um, in the First three quarters of 2019 versus 657 in the first uh, three quarters of 2020 are very uh, are quite stable um, whereas the investment amount however has gone down quite a bit from 165 uh, billion baht to 118 billion baht so that's a decrease of around 30 percent i assume that a lot of companies had already uh, rolled out or started the investment projects, which they did not stop um, in the in the current economic condition, but maybe they've downsized them a little bit. And of course, we expect to see 
uh, more uh, influence also in the in the near future, maybe in this year of 2021. Um, since of course not many applications um, and uh, well new business openings have been filed um, during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Yeah, how is the general regulatory framework uh, for foreign investment in Thailand? Uh, so um, the Foreign uh, Business Act of 1999 regulates foreign uh, investment. Uh, and basically specifies that foreigners, foreign companies, or companies with a majority foreign ownership, um, have to get specific licensing um, before they engage in certain restricted business activities. Uh, these restricted business activities are all kinds of service businesses. They cover retail trading and wholesale trading. Um, so uh, by and large, this is, these are most of the business activities, uh, with the exception of manufacturing. So all manufacturing activity does not require the specific licenses for foreigners. Of course, there are a number of uh, other licenses which everybody um, needs to get, but this is similar to the ones that Thai companies would also need. Uh, another area which is not regulated by the Foreign Business Act is export trading and companies trading uh, who have a high paid in capital, registered capital, of over 100 million baht, which equates to roughly 3 million euros. Um, companies, foreign companies have to deal with some other restrictions as well. There are restrictions on foreign land ownership. Uh, in most, in a general case, uh, foreigners cannot own land in Thailand. And there are also visa and work permit requirements for foreign staff. Um, and the regulations uh, in this respect are um, well, a little bit burdensome in a general case. Yeah. Um, now, Thailand, of course, is um, is a very interesting market for foreign direct investment and has been for a long time. And the Thai government, of course, also aims to promote foreign investment. And uh, in order uh, to uh, control this, they've come up with a number of promotions um, which companies can use and uh, these promotions are tackling uh, and, and uh, well, uh, bringing solutions to some of the restrictions which are posed here. Next slide, please. Yeah, as you can see on, on this slide, um, we've already talked about the investment amount here. Um, the, um, the main authority in Thailand uh, governing, governing foreign direct investment and business promotions is the Thailand Board of Investment or short BOI. I think everybody who is doing business in Thailand uh, is, is probably familiar with this agency. Um, under BOI promotions, investment can be made uh, all over Thailand. The BOI has a catalog of activities uh, and which lists uh, well the business activities which are being promoted, uh, specific requirements, uh, and then also uh, promotional benefits. And so this is the main authority that foreign companies uh, would deal with uh, when looking for investment in Thailand. Um, the second or second agency which we will look into today is the office of the EEC, the office of the Eastern Economic Corridor, which uh, governs and regulates uh, investment in the, in the Eastern Economic Corridor, uh, uh, special investment zone on the Eastern Seaboard uh, of Thailand. And uh, this um, Eastern Economic Corridor um, is uh, on, the one high, on the one hand uh, geo geographically limited to such uh, Eastern Seaboard and also limited in terms of the industries that they are looking to promote in that area. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we will start um, with a look into uh, the BUI incentives. As I mentioned, the BUI has a, a long catalog of business activities um, which they are promoting. Um, this catalog can be uh, downloaded, for example, from the website of, of the BOI, and it is very comprehensive in terms of the sectors and uh, the specific um, activities which it promotes. 
Now, the uh, business promotion of the BOI um, brings various incentives with it, uh, and they have grouped the uh, business activities in different levels, which you can see on this slide. Um, basically, each uh, business activity in the catalog um, will fall into one of the uh, levels of business promotion here, which uh, are labeled A1 to A4 and B1 and B2. And these levels uh, then translate to the uh, well to the level of business promotion that the company can get. So um, activities in the highest level, um, the A1 class, the highest regular level uh, is the A1, can get uh, eight years of corporate income tax uh, exemption with no cap, meaning there's there's no limitation uh, to the income tax exemption that uh, they can get. Um, other benefits are exemptions uh, of import duties when importing machinery, um, exemption on, on import duties um, of raw materials uh, used in the production for export, and also non-tax incentives. And when we go down in this uh, on this level of incentives, um, uh, activities which are um, ranked in a, in a in a lower level uh, may still get corporate income tax exemption or albeit uh, for a less number of years. Um, in the in those uh, A-level classifications here, whereas uh, investment promotions, which are still uh, deemed important for Thailand's development, but they are not uh, part of the targeted inter industries here in the group of uh, B1 and B2, um, they will get no tax exemption, but they still benefit from import duty exemption in some cases um, for machinery, for raw material, um, for export production in any case, and uh, very important for the non-tax incentives, which I will uh, come to on the next slide. Um, to finish here this overview, there are a number, uh, oh, sorry, can you go back please? Uh, that was misleading. Um, there are two more categories here on the, on the bottom, the 10 years um, uh, promotions. These are uh, promotions for business activities in, in targeted, uh, uh, for targeted technologies here that you can see in the pink uh, field, biotech, nanotech, uh, advanced medical, digital technology and supporting activities. So they can benefit from up to 10 years corporate income tax incentives. Now next slide please. I've mentioned that uh, that a very important part of the BOI incentives are uh, the non-tax incentives. So when we think back of the general uh, regulatory framework, we've uh, seen that there are restrictions on foreign business activities in Thailand. Um, however, with a BOI promotion, it is possible to get 100% uh, foreign ownership without uh, the requirement of a specific uh, separate uh, license. Um, uh, other incentives which are granted for BOI companies are um, uh, the permit to take out or remit money abroad, so it's very easy um, to uh, make transactions in foreign currencies. Also, there are um, uh, much less restrictions or nearly no restrictions on bringing foreign nationals uh, into Thailand for working here, for studying is investment opportunities and also uh, for uh, working then in the in the business in Thailand. And an important uh, factor is also the permission to own land. Next slide, please. Uh, besides these um, activity-based uh, incentives that we've just looked at with a number of years of corporate income tax exemption based on the character category, uh, Thailand has uh, singled out a number of, I would call them add-on factors, um, which can bring additional uh, benefits um, uh, to the businesses. So, for example, here, this is what they call the merit-based incentives. If companies are investing into research, technology development, uh, human resource development, or they are um, active in IP acquisition, uh, technology training, or they uh, do product and packaging design in Thailand by themselves or by partners, 
they can get additional corporate uh, income tax uh, exemptions um, of, of one to three years here and also additional caps uh, cap meaning uh, the corporate income tax amount is uh, in some cases limited to a certain uh, to the in, to the in original investment amount and uh, when partaking in these uh, extra incentives uh, by doing this um, by investing in, in certain fields uh, companies can get longer and higher corporate income tax exemption next slide please yeah, another area uh, where companies can benefit from, from extra incentives are uh, here the merit-based incentives based on decentralization and industrial area development. So Thailand has um, uh, singled out a few areas which shall benefit from, from extra incentives. Uh, first of all, these are here the brown areas that you can see on the map, which are the provinces with the lowest per capita income. So if companies are investing in these lesser developed areas of Thailand, they can get additional corporate income tax exemptions, um, uh, either uh, for full exemption or uh, for a number of years of a 50% income tax reduction. Um, furthermore, um, companies investing in special promoted industrial estates uh, and industrial zones can also get an additional year of corporate income tax exemption and the EEC which we will uh, look into uh, as in the next topic uh, is one of these zones where you can benefit from from this uh, promotion next slide please yeah on this on this slide uh, you can see uh, just an overview of uh, the sectors which were promoted uh, by the BOI uh, with new projects in, uh, in the first three quarters of 2020. So you can see uh, the majority of projects were in the metal products and machinery field, uh, also quite strong electric, electronic uh, products, actually even higher level of uh, products, but uh, a little bit less uh, investment amount and also services now, when you remember services is is one of the areas which is uh, highly regulated by the foreign business act and so a lot of companies use the boi promotions uh, in order to be able to engage in such business activities in thailand uh, with 100 percent foreign ownership next slide please Yeah, the next uh, topic brings us then uh, to the Eastern Economic Corridor. Um, so uh, what is, what is the, the Eastern Economic Corridor? Um, the, the corridor comprises three provinces uh, on the eastern seaboard of Thailand, uh, namely Chachong Sao province, Shonburi province and Rayong province. You can see them here uh, in, the, in the middle. Uh, of um, the seaboard here is, is uh, Bangkok. You can see the airport which is um, uh, put on the map here. And so the Eastern Economic uh, Corridor is everything on the Eastern side here. Um, this area um, is an area where we had a lot of uh, military infrastructure uh, historically. And uh, so this uh, was of course a great advantage uh, for the development of the area. And since the 1970s, um, the area has seen uh, a lot of investment and great uh, development in infrastructure, uh, in businesses, uh, both uh, national and from foreign, comp uh, foreign companies. Um, the advantages of this area um, are quite clear. First of all, it is located quite close to the capital. Um, it has a very good access to airports. Bangkok Airport, uh, um, of course, and then also on the south of the Eastern Economic Corridor, there's the Uta Pau uh, International Airport, a former military airport, which is now um, being extended for commercial use. Um, all the big seaports um, of Thailand are, are located here. Lem Shabang is the biggest one, and the Siracha Deep Sea Port um, in the middle, and then also you have the Mapta Put Port closer to, to Rayong in the south. Um, there is a very good connection of, of roads and motorways in that area. 
Um, there's a double track railroad uh, connecting major cities and the harbors, of course, and airports, and uh, also a high number of industrial estates, uh, which you can see with these uh, green and purple stars here um, on the map. Um, so this area is already uh, very well developed um, and the government has put on a number of projects to develop it even further in the future. There will be a, a high-speed rail which is planned um, to open in a number of years. Um, the seaports are being extended, the airport is being extended and also um, yeah, made more proper for commercial use which is already uh, starting right now. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, with the um, with the roadmap for the development of the EEC, the government has put up a number of uh, special promotional zones for specific industries. Um, they've given them uh, fancy names here. There's the ECH High Speed Rail Ribbon Sprawl, uh, which is uh, basically a promotional zone around the new high speed high-speed rail um, and, uh, and the stations. Um, there's a, a digital park uh, being built at uh, Siracha for digital technology with a data center, um, high-speed uh, internet access, um, and uh, they are planning to, uh, to bundle uh, companies from, from uh, such industries um, in those promotional zones. Uh, um, we have a medical hub here, which is around uh, Tamasat University in the hospital uh, near Pattaya. This is uh, being built and uh, right now and uh, expected to finish, I think, next year already. Um, there's the innovation center and there's, of course, the uh, extension of the Utapau Airport, where they're planning a whole airport city. So these are some specific promotional zones uh, in the EEC. And uh, the government is, is focusing on uh, industries uh, which are meshing to these uh, zones for investment here. No? But besides this, um, we have a, a longer list of targeted industries. Next slide, please. Uh, 12 targeted industries which are being promoted by the EEC. So those are uh, automotive sector, next generation like electrical cars, energy efficient cars, intelligent electronics, biotechnology, um, food processing with new technology, medical tourism, automation, robotics. Next slide, please. Uh, the digital industry again, uh, defense industry, aviation, comprehensive healthcare, biofuel, biochemicals, and uh, education and human resources. So companies or businesses in, in these uh, targeted industries are being able uh, to um, appreciate extra benefits when investing in the economic Eastern Economic uh, Corridor, and they can do so. Next slide, please. They can do so in the uh, specific um, uh, industrial estates uh, throughout the Eastern Economic Corridor, which are uh, labeled as the promoted zones. So here's a list of, of 21 uh, industrial estates uh, currently um, eligible for specific promotion in the EEC Corridor. Next slide, please. Yeah, so now what are the, the advantages of the EEC? We've seen that the, the BOI is actually the main regulatory body and the main agency regulating um, business promotions in Thailand. And um, this, the EEC and the BOI are also in a close uh, collaboration. Um, so tax holidays and other benefits for companies investing in the EEC are generally um, uh, or generally follow the BOI concept. Yeah? So they will also have to look at um, this list from the BOI and see uh, where they fall into uh, specific areas for business promotion. Um, then the EEC, however, qualifies, um, well, the EEC itself qualifies for the extra uh, one year of corporate income tax exemption, which we've seen. Uh, and on top of that, um, companies investing in the EEC can benefit from a flat income tax for their foreign expatriates, 
uh, of 17 percent which is a great benefit as the uh, personal income tax for high income earners in thailand can be uh, quite significant um, there are also specific regulations for land and real estate ownership it's uh, permitted both for business and also residential purpose which is uh, different from the boi and uh, there are longer lease options than the ones which are uh, normally available uh, in Thailand. So 50 plus 49 year land lease options here versus uh, normally only maximum of 30 years uh, land lease. Um, other areas with specific promotions are smart visas. Uh, so um, this is a special visa for experts and uh, top executives. Um, who can benefit from a much longer period uh, of four years versus one or just two years in a normal scenario and they didn't need no uh, specific and uh, no other work permit besides that yeah so when we look at the the advantages of the EEC um, mostly as I said they follow the BOI there's a, there's a few extra benefits um, they are um, maybe not extremely impressive uh, when we compare it to what the BOI can offer anyway. However, large uh, or big advantage besides, of course, maybe this tax, um, a flat tax rate is uh, what the EEC has to uh, offer in terms of the infrastructure and also in terms of the support that um, companies can get from the office of the EEC. Next slide, please. So the EC has a has a one-stop service center which um, uh, companies can contact and uh, use to deal with a number of government agency which are bundled under this service center and they provide services under eight laws uh, here, which are listed here so this makes it much easier for foreign companies in in dealing with government authorities uh, the classical BOI one-stop service center is uh, focusing on, on visa and work permit services. There is, however, also um, a, the BOI OSOS, which is not shown here, which also, um, uh, well, at least uh, gives information on a number of, of related um, um, other areas similar to uh, the EEC as well. Yeah. So uh, the has has certain advantages, um, but it is not completely a, a special, completely separate from what the BOI has to offer. But um, uh, just gives a little bit on top of of the BOI and has uh, certain advantages, of course, um, uh, in this infrastructure uh, field and when dealing with these government authorities. Yes, so this uh, sums up the Thailand part. Uh, next slide, please. You can see here a list of some references for uh, both the BOI uh, and the EEC. Um, both of them have very good uh, information in the English language available. So if you have uh, any questions, uh, my presentation is now finished and I'm happy to receive your questions and answer them maybe shortly so as not to take too much time from the other presenters. Uh, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, we actually have one question coming in here, and maybe you can just give a short review on that. Uh, so who and how to contact for investors wanting to get information or to discuss specific investment possibilities in the current COVID situation while being forced outside of Thailand? Yeah, uh, this is a, is a good question. Uh, so, of course, one uh, possible way is to contact us at Rödel & Partner. Um, um, but um, besides that, of course, a, a very good starting point is, is dealing with the, uh, with the BOI and with the EEC uh, themselves. Uh, both of them have very good uh, websites and, and also e-services, so they are also uh, available um, for online meetings, Skype meetings, um, especially the BOI. And besides that, uh, the BOI has a number of uh, foreign uh, offices. Uh, so there's a, a BOI uh, service office in Frankfurt, for example. Uh, there are a number of offices also in the ASEAN region, in, uh, in Vietnam, in Indonesia. And uh, the BOI is a contact point, um, both of course for the, let's say, the general um, BOI promotions and also uh, the specific uh, promotions in the EEC.
Thank you very sure. much. Um, so far, there are no further questions are coming in through the chat option. And as always, uh, if you just uh, need another uh, moment to, uh, to find your question, just give me a short uh, email and I will happy, be happy to liaise with Philip anytime soon. So uh, with regard to the time, I'd say we'd Thank you, Philip, for uh, sharing your insight on Thailand, and we'll gladly move over to Marianne for uh, the Philippine PEZA. Thank you. So, yes, also from my side, good uh, morning to Germany, uh, and good afternoon into the region, and Magandang uh, Hapon to those uh, who joined in from the Philippines. From uh, an established uh, FDI location in the ASEAN or Southeast Asian region, Thailand, we're moving on to, I would say, the new kids on the block, which is Philippines and uh, Myanmar, both countries which have been uh, in the recent years significantly uh, caught traction and attracted um, foreign direct investment or had a significant growth in uh, these areas. Uh, for the Philippines, in the area of foreign direct investment as well as the investment incentives. Uh, it's really cer certainly at the time a really interesting uh, period because a lot has happened in the past years and month and I'm not just talking about all the effects that uh, COVID had on the economy not just here in the Philippines. There have been uh, in the last years uh, starting 2010 already but also under the new government uh, 2016 uh, significant uh, reforms uh, in, of the Philippine uh, legislation. Uh, there has been or is still ongoing a major tax reform which we will talk about uh, later in more detail. Uh, the 11th negative list has been published which uh, works towards uh, more liberalization and more foreign direct investment restrictions. That means more sectors are open for 100% or for a lower percentage of um, um, foreign ownership restrictions. We have the anti-red tape law, which uh, efficiently uh, works towards cutting red tape. And yeah, there has been definitely throughout all the departments a clear uh, commitment to of the government towards uh, promoting uh, foreign investment in the Philippines. Um, what will we be talking about or how they structure um, this presentation? So we first, uh, same as for Thailand, have a brief uh, overview about the FDI investment framework. Um, for this, as well as for any other uh, point, uh, since we only have about uh, 20 plus minutes uh, for, for my presentation, if there are any questions, uh, just give me a call or just follow up and I'm happy to uh, lay out uh, these topics which we just, uh, due to the time, uh, can, can this, uh, mention or discuss briefly. Uh, I will, will, will be happy to share with you more details. So first, the investment framework. Second, we go over the investment incentives. Um, um, we have a brief incentive comparison on the regional level. We then move on to the uh, framework, general framework in the Philippines for the incentives. Um, then PESA, which is mentioned on which is the main agent, one of two main agencies amongst many uh, dealing with uh, incentives uh, in uh, the Philippines. And last but not least, I think we go actually to the more important topic, which uh, nobody knows which direction it will be going at the end, but we're having, as I mentioned at the moment, a major tax reform. And uh, actually within the next days, even the next weeks, there might actually be already a completely different incentive framework uh, in place or passed uh, by uh, the Congress of the Philippines. Uh, so therefore, we actually uh, want to take a peek in the future as much as that is possible and also focus, uh, try to focus a bit more about what's uh, lying ahead. So we're going to the next uh, slide um, for a brief introduction about the Philippines. I think uh, important to know about the Philippines is, uh, again, for the population. We're currently at 109 million uh, uh, in the Philippines. That means the Philippines is the second biggest uh, market in ASEAN by uh, population. If you look at it, we came, we, we would look at the figures 2010, it was about 85, 86 million. As I mentioned, now we are at 100, around 110 million. If we look at 2030s, we're around 130 million. Uh, if we look at the year 2050, we're going towards 150 uh, million. So we have a country with a significant uh, population growth, which is already um, uh, 
with, together with Indonesia, um, second biggest market, uh, which is of course for many companies uh, from a consumer point of view, but also many other points of view, uh, really interesting. Um, the average age is something that's the Philippine actually one of the uh, leading the statistics so amongst the top 10 uh, in the world is having the, the youngest or uh, amongst the youngest um, working population. Um, if you go into employed persons, well, we're at 40 million currently with a relatively high um, of our employment, unemployment rate. Um, before COVID, it was around 4%, so that's uh, actually pretty good. Um, same as for Thailand, uh, issue also in the Philippines is that there is, uh, of course, a lot of work in the informal sector, there's a lot of underemployment, so these, these figures uh, have to be looked at with, uh, with caution. But yeah, COVID uh, hit the Philippines economy hard, it hit the uh, people hard, so we are now at the high unemployment rate. It was actually even uh, worse uh, during mid of uh, 2020, but uh, slowly uh, recovering. I jump immediately actually to the cross domestic product, which uh, the Philippines has, is around, uh, um, uh, you, you see the amount. The more interesting thing is if we look again in the future together with the population growth that I, I showed you just now, we're looking actually that uh, Philippines will be in 2050 amongst the uh, third or fourth uh, biggest economic power in uh, Asia, so not just Southeast Asia, but Asia, and amongst the 16th, one six uh, biggest um, economies in the world. So currently somewhere around, I think, 200 countries is somewhere around there. Um, we're around right in the middle of the field, but there is a significant growth potential and um, that's uh, what makes the Philippines uh, interesting. Moving on to the next slide, let's have a brief uh, look at uh, the COVID situation, I think, which has the biggest influence in every country on economics, on our private lives. So the Philippines, we are um, one of the countries with the longest and also strictest uh, lockdown. We actually never really came out of the lockdown, at least in the main uh, cities. So in the Philippines, uh, on 15 March, uh, the, the lockdown was uh, announced, which is called uh, the Enhanced Community Quarantine. The lockdown was basically that offices had to close and only essential business were allowed to open. And the enhanced uh, lockdown actually meant also, um, depending on the region, how strictly it was enforced, that people were not allowed to leave their houses except uh, for getting medicine, buying grocery. Then throughout uh, the months uh, towards June, uh, more and more industries were added to those, those essential, those opening up. Uh, so we moved from an enhanced community quarantine to so-called mod modified enhanced community quarantine to the general community quarantine in June, which is basically when, when the Philippines uh, opened up after a month difficult month for the economies. I've seen numbers where about 70% of all companies in the Philippines, uh, the offices closed, means that were, which were not considered essential. And 40% uh, actually of all companies in the Philippines were entirely closed for the period at least until uh, from March to June, which is uh, of course a difficult situation for the economy and for the companies. And since June, basically, and actually until now, um, it depends on the region where you are. Uh, we are under a general community quarantine, which means that companies are allowed to operate of course, keeping uh, those social distancing requirements and other safety measures um, uh, have to comply with, uh, comply with that. Many companies still uh, maintain actually a work from home. In our building, it's still pretty empty um, because companies are yeah, operating, but operating to a significant part uh, from work from home. The numbers uh, I think were manageable. We see same as in Thailand as in many other countries now after the Christmas holidays, the number is going up again. Uh, we had uh, yesterday 1,500 cases. Uh, before Christmas, we were actually always below 1,000. Um, so we will be careful monitoring this. Where are we going to for the future? That might be certainly interesting for, for, for 
future investment might be interesting for those already operating in the Philippines. Um, um, well, the vaccine actually, the vaccine, 30 million doses were bought uh, within the last days, and the first tranches are supposed to reach uh, in February. We'll arm it for uh, nose nurses or the so called frontliners, um, but it will uh, certainly take uh, a significant time in the Philippines until uh, all the vaccine can be properly distributed. We see the challenges that uh, that, that very developed countries face. So um, we will in the Philippines, uh, I think we are doing well with the situation, but uh, it will take some time till everybody has a vaccine. Let's go to the next slide um, and have a look at the impact of COVID or uh, the economic growth. Um, you see what's actually um, specific for the Philippines, or what I always like to highlight is the Philippines compared to other countries throughout the years, many, many years, uh, 2010 or even before, um, um, has always a very steady growth on a high level. So it's always one of the top growth countries, increasing actually still significant foreign direct investment and, uh, and economic growth. Um, but uh, more importantly, it's always on a stable level, uh, actually, even during crisis, financial crisis before and so on. Well, if we look at this, um, we see like a significant drop uh, for um, 2020. Um, but um, yeah, same as for all companies, we have a significant drop, but all analysts uh, kind of expect that the Philippines will uh, bounce back, uh, same as many other countries, to uh, the old levels, which is a growth of uh, 6%. If that will happen in 2021, um, what many analysts say, I'm a bit skeptical about it. I think for our operation, for, we are rather planning that things will stay more or less similar to um, what we experienced the last three, four months here in the Philippines um, in terms of the situation, how to operate business and so on. But uh, let's see what certain or what I certainly support is that uh, there's little doubt that the Philippines will bounce back to, to, to its old strength and that maybe the Philippines might actually even be a country that uh, might be benefiting from uh, the, the whole situation because with more people working from home, location not becoming um, such a significant factor anymore. A country which has been one of the leading in the world for um, business process outsourcing, for basically doing all the work from call centers to back office work to now also knowledge outsourcing, doing all the work that is not necessarily required to be at a specific place. Uh, it might be likely that a country like Philippines might then benefit from it, that having the infrastructure, having the system, having the people here, um, that uh, the Philippines might benefit then from uh, some work being a bit more um, globally at um, um, different places and not necessarily at the office space. Let's go to the next slide. Um, just very quickly showing you again the economic growth for the Philippines. So you saw earlier that we ended up at a growth around 7.3%. Um, we came from a much darker space uh, right before the economy opened up in June, which was the economy, the economy growth of minus 16.9%. Same also for the labor figures with a high unemployment play rate, but now steadily uh, recovering for that. And uh, I think the trend uh, will, will continue, continue that. We can already go to the next slide. For the next slide, I gave you a brief comparison about the countries that we're um, talking about today, uh, about the investment incentives. Uh, well, it's very detailed, actually, so I just well, we just broke it down and followed um, the OECD statistics uh, on, on two topics. One is the corporate income tax, and the second is the income tax holidays. As you see, the Philippines has, as of uh, date, still the highest uh, corporate income tax rate in uh, ASEAN 10 or in, in Southeast Asia actually um, and with regards to um, income tax holidays well it's only four to eight years if we compare that to the others it's still amongst uh, the lower ones but certain incentives could be also not necessarily income tax holidays but many incentives could also be given actually to companies without any restrictions um, so, so there's a 
interesting framework for the Philippines. Um, let's move on to the next slide, talking already about uh, what kind of incentives we have here in the Philippines. Um, the regulatory framework uh, falls all back to the so-called Omnibus Investment Code of 1987, which was uh, introduced uh, by an executive order of, at that time, the president, uh, Corazon Aquino. And uh, it lays out basically uh, all the principles uh, for the other laws and for the investment, uh, that foreign investment as well as local investment that's still applicable uh, today. Uh, it focuses or actually uh, mentions that uh, the private sector is considered as a, pri a prime mover for the economic growth. Um, and um, it was also the first law creating a, a investment board or also one of the purest investment boards in the Southeast Asian regions. And it also was among the early stage where investment priority plan was uh, introduced already in 1987, which at the beginning was like uh, um, updated every year and currently the period is actually that it's updated every three years with the new legislation we will see. I think it will stay at a three years period that the investment promotion plan will be updated. Um, I mentioned already the investment promotion plan, then there is a lot of specific legislation for incentives is one of the reasons why we're looking in the Philippines uh, at a major tax reform. It's not just about the corporate income tax in general, it's actually uh, also about to streamline, uh, to bring together um, some of those regulation, regulations, which I've read, it's about 90 to 100 different laws. So to, to, to simplify it, the laws that you see here is basically those uh, referring to specific economic zones. And we can already move to the next uh, slide. The next slide uh, shows the current, uh, gives a good overview of the, the current um, investment incentive regulatory framework. Uh, it's uh, split up in uh, the incentives that are given by the respective um, agencies. The two key agencies are the first one, which is the Bureau of Investment uh, and the PESA, Philippine Economic Zone Authority, and uh, which is um, the zones, you know, the investment uh, incentives are applicable um, throughout the entire area of the Philippines. While those others that you see uh, there, which is the first one, is the Clark Development uh, Corporation, the Subic Bay Metropolitan. Uh, Authority. And then we have the Cagayan uh, Economic Zone Authority, uh, and so on. Uh, these are regionally based um, economic zones which have their own framework, overall relatively similar, but we have to look basically either at the first two or um, the framework for the entire Philippines or then the specific area where the investment is located. Um, key. Um, Incentives are in the Philippines that um, for new companies uh, we have uh, an um, income tax holiday of uh, four to six years. For extension projects, uh, normally another three years might be, be added. So that's for, for PISA and, and for the BOI. Uh, and then after that, um, for those located in PISA, that there is a reduced income tax rate or special corporate income tax uh, of. 5% with uh, for some without any restrictions and um, then we have if you're located in or if you um, have the approval for any of, of these authorities normally income tax and uh, not incomes import um, um, easing of import restrictions and so on I don't want to talk too much actually about this because again, you can ask uh, for the presentation and it gives a really good overview of the current system of incentives. And as I mentioned, um, these kind of incentives were in a current, in a period of uh, reforming it, uh, the, the authorities will stay, even though there will be a little bit of restructuring, but already within a few days, um, there might be a different framework. So we want to move on actually to the new framework or potential new framework to, as I mentioned earlier, peek into the future. Um, let's go to the next slide then. As I mentioned, the two 
uh, main bodies or incentives in the Philippines are the um, uh, BOI um, and is PESA. PESA focuses significant more on export enterprises. That means when more than 70% of uh, the sales or uh, services are provided for uh, overseas use, but that's where the revenue is, is generated, um, you qualify for, for, for PESA, while the Bureau of uh, BOI I is uh, actually also more on local investment. Um, for PISA, we have in the Philippines, all over the Philippines, about 408 uh, economic zones. Economic zones does not necessarily mean that it's an area with fences or, or you know, like a village or a small city. Economic zone or, uh, can be also a building actually here in the Philippines. You might have heard that the Philippines, and I mentioned it earlier, is well known for its uh, call centers for business process outsourcing. And here in Metro Manila, we are sitting in, in Makati, many of those buildings also qualify as uh, PISA buildings and uh, under the economic zone framework. Um, let's move on to the next slide already. For PISA, you have to qualify under any of those um, categories or activities uh, that are mentioned here. Um, uh, plus, most other activities are by nature already or then with regard to the specific regulations uh, export uh, oriented. Um, let's move on to the next slide already. The, one back, yes. The incentives, uh, we saw it actually earlier on the general overview. Uh, for time, the incentives that PISA generally grants are again the income tax holidays, which depend on how the project is categorized. So, non pioneering projects, we have about four years pioneering projects, that means a technology which is new to the Philippines or anything like that. We have about six years and then if uh, for additional investment, uh, additional um, knowledge transfer or anything uh, uh, similar to that, uh, we can have an extension project of uh, three years for the income tax holidays. And then after the income tax holidays, as long as you're in PISA, you have a reduced uh, income tax uh, rate to 5%, which is, of course, uh, making quite a difference uh, compared to the 30% uh, that other companies have to pay that I mentioned. But it has to be uh, calculated still on an individual basis, um, which framework might make sense because many of those export enterprises are also on a cost plus basis or, or anything. So. Um, um, in Texas, uh, income taxes might be not necessarily one of the main factors. It's a key. It's a, It's of course an important factor, but there are other things like infrastructure and um, the area and so on, uh, where we're located, which might be of uh, more significance, more importance. Then what I mentioned earlier, there's uh, duty-free importation and uh, easier processes for that. There's a zero rating for VATS. Uh, there's um, uh, some additional deductions that you can do for labor and training expenses. Um, and also um, there's a specific visa that you just call the 47A uh, visa, which uh, primarily is given to those located in uh, PESA zones. And this visa is actually currently um, um, of a great benefit because uh, the Philippines has still uh, restrictions for foreigners to uh, enter the country. And the PISA visa is uh, actually one of those uh, few visas uh, which allows foreigners to re-enter the country uh, compared to those on the so-called 9G visa, the standard employment visa, which is still until today um, from ECQ from last year, March, not allowed to enter in the country. There is specific uh, um, exemptions and so on. So of course we, we can still for, for urgent matters uh, apply for exemptions to get the people into the country. But just mentioning a uh, year PISA, PISA visa is definitely a, a benefit nowadays. Um, all right, let's go already on to the next slide. Let me just mention one thing about PISA, how it works. So um, the, um, you need to be located in a PISA zone or you need to be located in a PISA building. I mean, that's the key requirement. I said another key requirement, with some exceptions, is that it's mostly export-oriented. 
uh, of course, then the nature uh, of the business, which need to be amongst those uh, qualifying businesses. And the third thing is actually it's a very individual process that means you have to submit an application to the board of PESA, which then will approve that application based on uh, individual requirements. So there might be also requirements uh, with regards to the capital, to the investment, uh, how many uh, employment created and so on. So it's uh, in its nature actually a very individual process and uh, it depends on those the approval or the approval document that you get from PESA itself um, for your um, investment or for the incentives. Let's go on to the topic that I want actually to focus more on, but with the time uh, we still make, an, make it in an overview. Uh, also because uh, this law that's going to be passed uh, is still in the process uh, of, of debate within the Congress. So it's very likely that what we see or what we're talking about now will be very soon passed and will be passed uh, with uh, the content that we're going to discuss. But still, it's not a given law. It's not an effective law yet. So there might be still some changes. Um, as I mentioned in the Philippines, we had significant reforms. So a challenge in the Philippines was bureaucracy is uh, bureaucracy. Another challenge was in the Philippines that there were not many reforms or legislation might take many, many years until it's passed. Um, since 2016, we have actually, particularly on the text level, say that there have been significant changes and reforms. And it started in 2017 with the so-called comprehensive tax reform program of the current um, administration for a simplified and more efficient tax collection system to lower the heck tax, what we're going to talk about, and a more transparent and equal, uh, equal tax system. And uh, for a state perspective, it was supposed to uh, give a higher revenue collection. I have a sentence to that later as well. Uh, the comprehensive tax reform was split into or is split into five uh, phases, into five different uh, programs. Uh, the first one is the so-called TRAIN-1 or TRAIN Act, the Tax Reform for Acceleration and Inclusion Act, which was passed uh, 19 December 2000. In 17, and this act focused uh, primarily on the personal income tax, where the Philippines um, had actually compared to other nations, uh, let's say we were midfield or lower income tax, what they had with regards to the hex, uh, head tax rate, but um, the brackets seem like in many countries where if you have a certain income, you have to pay a certain you're in a certain bracket with a certain tax rate. They were, I think, 15, 20 years old, so not really up to date to today's uh, income. And uh, therefore, people were, relatively speaking, in rel relatively high uh, tax rates. So that's what uh, Train One primarily did in this reform by adjusting the tax rates and adjusting the tax brackets um, to a more um, up to date uh, system, plus some special or sin taxes that were introduced, smoke, tobacco, petrol, and so on. So it was a big step uh, forward because in the Philippines, there has been for 25 years not been a major reform like that without any need due to a crisis and so on. So it started uh, with. Uh, with train one passed uh, the train left the station and moved on to train two. Train two was meant to to deal with or is meant to deal with uh, the corporate income tax, particularly to reduce the corporate income tax. We saw earlier that the Philippines has still one of the highest in Asia. And well, the deliberation took a bit longer as expected. The law was expected actually to be passed within the same year. Uh, from 2019, uh, in the deliberation, we moved actually to a different name for the same same thing, which was then to see TIRA, which is the Corporate Income Tax and Incentive uh, Reform Act, uh, which was uh, passed by the lower house, by the House of Representatives in 2020. And then going through the process in the Philippines, it needs to be uh, also passed by the Senate. The Senate uh, started its delibera deliberations uh, in the so-called Way and Means uh, Committee uh, under hel the helm of um, Senator Pia Cayetano. And um, this, the so-called Create Bill, um, was actually, we go to the next slide, was passed or was approved in the last reading of the Senate just uh, shortly before Christmas on the 26th of November. 
And um, the president uh, mentioned that this passing this law would be of high priority for the Philippines and for him. And the House of Representatives, the lower house, had actually signaled that uh, they will, in the next reading, actually just pass the law and move on and that the law would be implemented by now. But um, unfortunately, and it's not really clear uh, the, the, why that happened, um, the House of uh, Representatives then decided actually still to ask for further deliberations on this act and to call for a committee with both chambers to, to find a common ground to um, pass this law. Both chambers, I mean, Senate as well, House of Representatives have clearly addressed the urgency of this law. Um, it could be passed actually within the month, within a very short period of time, but it could be also uh, that we see the results maybe towards end of the year or something. Uh, nobody really knows. So, so let's let's see about that. What are the key features of the law? I quickly go through the key points. If you have any questions, um, just address it to me afterwards. So most important is uh, the law will lower the corporate income tax for companies from the 30% to 25%. Initially, it was discussed to put this by 1% every year, uh, or even to lower it to 20%. But then uh, COVID came, and um, while for the step-by-step -step, uh, lowering of, 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 the, of the tax rate, um, the, the finance ministry was like strictly against it with COVID. Uh, that, um, was one of the indicators or one of the things that helped to grow lower it by 5% straight away to give the companies uh, additional support um, to deal with the current uh, situation or the COVID related situation. For small media companies which have a taxable income of less than 5 million peso and also uh, assets of less than 100 million peso, excluding the property which is related to their operations. Um, they will uh, have an even lower tax rate of 20% um, for a special hospital educational institutions where at 10%, but more importantly, it will actually be reduced for the next three years uh, on 1% if the law is passed. Um, for the special form of investment in the Philippines, uh, the regional headquarters, regional operational headquarter, they had actually already a, a lower tax rate of 10%. That is one of the things where the incentives will be uh, scrapped and where it will move up actually in taxation to 25%. And for those uh, small uh, companies, uh, for, you know, actually for, for the minimum corporate income tax rate, that means if you have a certain uh, years of losses, uh, you have actually after a certain period of time to, to pay a certain amount of, of tax that reduced the minimum corporate income tax rate uh, that will be lowered from 2 to 1%. And we can go on to the next slide already. Further incentives, uh, we have foreign source dividends, which were before taxable. Um, for the tax rate, it really depends on, on the, on the um, tax treaty that's applicable, but that under the new law uh, shall not be uh, taxable. Um, most likely will be still taxed that these dividends need to be invested into uh, the company in the Philippines um, and also a certain percentage of which has to be held. Good, then VAT exemptions, the VAT threshold will be released, improperly accumulated uh, earnings tax uh, will be uh, repealed most likely under the new law. We go to um, the um, um, next stop, which is that the next slide, which is more on the organizational side. Before we had lots of different authorities all doing kind of their own things so under the new law. We, uh, the Financial Incentive Revenue Board will be created to overlook and coordinate uh, all the incentives. And this will be also the board that will do the, um, formulate the priority plan in a three year period. Uh, in the future, the, each authority was fighting hard that they maintain the authority for their incentives. So that will be the, the case of maintain under the say the law for the investment promotion agencies uh, up to 1 billion peso, they will make the decisions on their end. 
if it's higher, it will go directly in the decision to the financial incentive review board. And then there's the super incentive that means for huge, uh, huge projects uh, for uh, more than 10,000 jobs created straight away or 15 billion peso, that will go up to the president who has then the flexibility uh, with incentives to make uh, certain decisions. But it has to be clear that there is uh, certain time limits overall for the incentives, 40 years. And there will be still the standard exemption for uh, income tax holidays for the big budget projects. Um, income tax holidays, um, I just briefly mentioned that to, uh, together with the specific income tax rate that will be after. We will have to see uh, how that will work, but it will be overall, it shall be um, limited and it shall depend um, on depends also on the location and on the nature of the business. So there are different tiers with regards um, the, how uh, interesting the investment is for the Philippines, how, how much, uh, so the, if it's a base investment or it's an enhanced investment, you will get more in a complex holidays. And the more you get out of the main centers like Metro Manila and so on, the more uh, the period will extend as well. Good, we go to the next slide and then we are actually almost done. Um, there will be tax allowance and deductions which will be uh, more introduced. I will not go through all of them. Uh, we can discuss about them later on. Uh, but it's important to know that for these additional tax allowances, deductions uh, that are uh, introduced under the new bill, that they will be either you have uh, the specific income tax holidays for a certain period or you can use the tax uh, deductions, but you cannot do both. So um, we can move already on to the next two slides, or to actually my last slide, exactly this one. Uh, big discussion for the bill was always um, what happens to those who have invested in the Philippines and trusted for 10, 15, 20 years that the legislation will not uh, change and so on. So um, what will be the so-called sunset provision? And um, well, it's, it's stated on um, that slide that those having in, uh, income tax holiday can enjoy them until the end of, of uh, what's in their regulation, uh, that those who have a special corporate income tax rate can enjoy it for a maximum period of 10 years. And then more importantly, as I mentioned, you have, there's either the lower tax rate or the deductibilities. So companies can at any time discuss if they want to switch and uh, basically calculate which um, um, method might be more beneficial for them. So I'm done actually, and um, yeah, I leave it to uh, my colleague in Myanmar, or if there's uh, time for any questions, we, I think we can also just do that at the end. Thank you very much, Marian. There's no doubt that the Philippines are one of the most versatile uh, countries in the region, and thank you so much for this very uh, comprehensive insight. So uh, I'll take down any questions coming in uh, so we can move over to Alexandra in Myanmar to uh, have enough time uh, left for the next country. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to talk about the general uh, investment situation in Myanmar and in particular about the um, special economic zone of Tilawa. And um, with regards uh, to the time, I think we can uh, switch already to the next slides. Yeah, here just a little bit the agenda. The next slide, please. Yeah, so as an introduction, uh, Myanmar is a country with uh, 55, uh, uh, 54 million people uh, with a young average age of uh, 29 years old <coughs> and um, has a, a comparably low uh, unemployment rate. The, uh, gross uh, wage is uh, also comparably uh, <coughs> small amount uh, to neighboring countries, as we also heard before. And um, uh, the, but the economic growth in general is um, is quite good in Myanmar since many years, always uh, around six to seven percent uh, <coughs> due to the COVID situation in the last year. Uh, it actually went down to 1.7%. Um, next slide, please. Um, but it's uh, the World Bank 
projected that actually starting from uh, March in this year, um, the situation, the economic situation in Myanmar could actually uh, start to recover already. And by next year, um, the World Bank is projecting a, a growth rate of 7% again. Um, so <clears throat> as a general overview of the uh, investment situation in Myanmar, um, you can see that uh, a lot of things uh, changed here in the last years. Uh, so after the opening uh, of the country in 2010, uh, it's quite uh, impressive what actually happened. Uh, always keep in mind uh, from which state actually Myanmar uh, started to be developed uh, since 10 years. And um, so what happened in this 10 years is, uh, is quite impressive. Um, especially in the last uh, four or five years, um, the reform process was uh, uh, quite steady and uh, going into the right direction. And uh, for the last year, the government actually expected that uh, the uh, situation in Myanmar, uh, that the reforms from the previous years would actually materialize. Then came COVID, unfortunately, but uh, still um, the reforms are substantial and uh, bring uh, the country in the next years uh, definitely even further. Um, one of the <coughs> developments uh, in the last year was the establishment of the project bank uh, for governmental tenders, so to create more uh, transparency for investors and uh, the whole uh, tender processes. Um, so this has been uh, received quite well. Um, we had in 2018 um, the new corporate law with an online filing system called uh, MICO, which is a state-of-the-art um, online system and part of uh, <coughs> part of an e-government um, system, basically, which is uh, aimed to be uh, covering most uh, parts of the authorities. Um, in the last year, we saw also quite some changes in the tax regime. So there was a change to the self-assessment system, which makes the tax assessments uh, much quicker. And uh, it's also an online filing system. So also going in the same direction with this uh, as, the, as the micro system. Um, a new income tax law is expected. It's not yet passed by the parliament. Um, but the draft is so far actually also quite promising. Um, yeah, so also <clears throat> the last year, the government actually right in time for the pandemic um, introduced uh, online filings for uh, online um, system for submission of taxes. And um, this is also working quite well. Um, and uh, we have uh, several <coughs> tax incentives in the special economic zones and rural areas. And uh, quite in general, uh, it's still a focus on the infrastructure in, in the whole country, which of course was um, yeah, uh, in the past uh, decades uh, very worn down, but uh, new highways have been built, uh, airports extended and uh, renewed and uh, the whole situation, especially in Yangon, in the economic center of the country, uh, has improved significantly. Um, also in the last year, we had a new IP law and uh, uh, also a new insolvency law, which was introduced, but is not fully uh, effective yet. But um, this is also expected to be finalized soon. Um, we had the first foreign bank uh, fully, um, uh, not only a branch, but a, a full entity here in Myanmar also in the last year. And um, quite recently also insurance international insurance companies entered the country uh, where insurances basically before were not existent. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> then we come already to the special economic zone in Tilawa, um, which is uh, one of the most successful projects of the government and uh, a very substantial investment. It's uh, in the proximity of Yangon, 
so just 23 kilometers uh, southeast of Yangon, uh, which is about one hour drive. Um, currently, there is still um, some bottlenecks with, uh, with a bridge and some road constructions, but the second bridge is being built already and uh, the whole uh, infrastructure to Tilawa is also um, improved constantly. Um, the Tilawa Special Economic Zone is also right next to the uh, Deep River port and uh, the construction started in 2013 but became uh, operational in 2015 and um, it's an uh, international standard, um, uh, basically a joint venture between uh, Myanmar and uh, Japan and uh, with a 10% for, for uh, governmental um, sites each and uh, then a Myanmar private consortium and a Japanese private, uh, private consortium. The next slide please. Yeah, so the total size uh, is aimed to be uh, around 2,400 hectare, um, but so far I think it's only uh, around 560 which have been developed, um, but the whole area is basically con constantly under, uh, um, yeah, under construction and improvement. So um, um, right now there are around 117 multinational companies uh, which are uh, present in the economic zone and uh, uh, represent uh, investors from uh, around 19 countries, uh, of course mainly from uh, uh, other Asian countries, um, but also from Germany and other European countries. Um, the FDI is over 2 billion US dollars so far and uh, locally 10,000 jobs have been created. Um, it's uh, fulfills two purposes basically. Um, the one is the export oriented, so uh, for manufacturing, um, cup, make, pack um, is also uh, quite an important uh, point there. And uh, of course trading, processing of um, and equipment and logistic companies are based there. And uh, also the domestic market is of course uh, quite important. So you, you have a lot of uh, steel companies there, construction uh, material, um, yeah, manufacturing, packaging also quite important and so on and so forth. The next slide please. So um, the infrastructure, as I said, is being constantly uh, developed. So the uh, river in Yangon has been uh, uh, further dragged out um, and now even bigger vessels uh, with a draft of 10 meters uh, can enter um, the river um, and uh, of course improve the, the situation for the port there. Um, then as I mentioned before already, the new Bagu River Bridge uh, is expected to become operational in the next year <clears throat> and so the uh, bottleneck of the bridge will be also solved. A new four-lane road uh, connecting Yangon to Tilawa um, has been opened in the last year and uh, you can see on the map on the right side um, two uh, also envisaged uh, new projects. The one is the Yangon Elevated Expressway and uh, also the uh, outer ring road is planned, which then also connects Tilawa even better to the rest of the area of Yangon. The next slide, please. Yeah, for the <coughs> short view into the regulatory framework. Um, so the Myanmar Special Economic Zone Law is, uh, of course, in the Tilawa SEZ uh, the, the most important. And um, there are two zones. Uh, the one is the uh, free zone area, which is deemed to be situated outside of the country and is uh, rather export oriented, um, which, for example, comes uh, <coughs> in uh, quite well with the uh, with the cut make uh, pack um, uh, sector or garment uh, sector also and other um, sectors. 
and then we have the promotion zoom um, with this, with this uh, which is an internal taxation area situated within the special economic zoom and is rather for the domestic market. Um, then also quite uh, interesting was uh, um, the situation with uh, what they only have in the economic zoom um, about the warehousing. Um, so you could also um, yeah, open a warehouse um, with an investment of two million and uh, that gave you the opportunity also for trading activities and uh, of course in a, in a country like Myanmar um, it also improved the steady supply of goods. Um, yeah, import and uh, wholesale of goods is possible also with an investment of two million, not including the rent fees. Um, and I think we can already switch to the next slide. So there are several uh, tax incentives which might be interesting um, for you um, in the special economic zone. Um, so there is a corporate income tax exemption for the first five to seven years. Um, depending on the investment, uh, if the, whether the investment is in the free zone area or um, in, the, in the other zone. So, and after the four, five to seven years tax uh, holiday, um, you can also apply for a continuing um, tax holiday at 50% uh, rate from the corporate income tax for another five years. Uh, normally the corporate income tax rate is by 25% and uh, even after those second five years you can um, even apply for further um, exemption there. Um, in the free zone area is also an exemption from custom duties and other taxes for importation of capital goods um, which is quite interesting for uh, many of the investors currently in the SEZ already and uh, also an exemption from the commercial tax for import of raw materials, um, which is also only in the free zone area. And uh, if you invest into, uh, into the training of stuff or research and development, um, there are also tax exemptions for or tax deductions uh, for uh, the <coughs> amount that you invest into the training or research and development. The next slide, please. And of course, you can always uh, contact me afterwards if you have a further detailed question. I'm happy to answer those. Um, yeah, further advantages um, are, of course, the land lease for up to 75 years, uh, meaning yeah, 50 years plus the option of 25 years extension. Um, uh, as mentioned before, it's an international standard. Um, so you have uh, quite a good uh, infrastructure there. Um, uh, steady electricity supply and uh, waste management uh, and so on and so forth. Um, also a new uh, power plant, uh, LNG power plant is uh, um, planned uh, near the uh, SEZ in Tilawa and to become operational in 23, um, which will bring another 20% of the whole country's uh, electricity supply. Uh, quite an impressive um, Japanese investment there. Um, then, of course, also another advantage is the one-stop service center um, from the direct rate of investment and also the tax authorities. Um, so there are short ways when you're uh, based in the SEZ and uh, most processes are further streamlined than, than in the rest of the country. Um, which makes or which is aimed to make uh, it easier for investors to actually um, start their <coughs> projects uh, quicker and without uh, many hindrances. Um, then also interesting is the reinsurance business is permitted since the middle of last year um, with three new categories allowed um, for general insurance, uh, industrial and construction all risk um, and Bailey's liability insurance. Um, as I mentioned before already, the insurance business is quite new in Myanmar. Um, so this is uh, quite, uh, uh, of course, quite important for investors um, 
and it's also interesting how that will develop in the next years. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what is the outlook in general when we talk about the economic zones in Myanmar? Um, uh, there are three uh, new uh, SEZs um, basically permitted in the Yangon region. Um, they're uh, all in the northeast, basically, of Yangon, situated um, with also substantial investments uh, from Korea, um, Thailand, and Singapore. And uh, then we have the uh, projects or the uh, special economic zones in Chaopu and in Dawei, which are um, Chaopu is a, is a Chinese Myanmar investment and also on the way a little longer already um, and will be part of the China Myanmar Economic Corridor um, and also uh, that gained up on speed uh, in the end of last year with uh, uh, new confirmations from the Chinese side for the investment uh, so uh, a quicker development in the next years is expected there and the uh, special economic zone in the way also very interesting from the geostrategic uh, position um, and the proximity to Thailand um, is supposed to uh, be also with a deep sea port um, which is currently not yet uh, existent but uh, will be uh, or is aimed to be one of the uh, no, the biggest uh, port in Southeast Asia in the future. Um, and uh, with the transportation of, of goods uh, from Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia uh, to that way, uh, and then further to, to Europe, um, the position is, is uh, really promising. And uh, many ships can uh, reduce their transportation costs um, with the avoidance of the Street of Malacca and can go directly to the West, basically. Um, the Dawei Special Economic Zone also was uh, um, in the past a bit underfunded and uh, did not really pick up uh, yet, but last year, also in the end of last year, um, the Japanese or the JICA um, also committed further to the project and uh, the road and railway connection to Thailand is being developed. Um, so. This will be in future a uh, very interesting uh, project also. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, then here's some uh, useful references uh, for uh, some of the mentioned topics. And as I said before, um, please always feel free to contact me if you have further questions. Uh, happy to elaborate uh, the one or other topic uh, in further detail. And uh, yeah, I, I'm happy that I could recover a little bit for the time. And uh, if there are any questions right now, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, and thank you very much for speeding things up a little so we could almost stick to the time frame. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, so here's, here's one question, nonetheless, that I would like you to hear. And maybe you could give us a short um, insight, your, your insight on that briefly. Uh, what would you say is the impact of COVID-19 on the investment in, t in the Tilapa SEZ? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, of course, uh, some investors uh, paused their investment or new investors um, also um, had to cancel investments. And so you definitely have a negative impact in the SEZ, but uh, comparably not that strong. And uh, 18 of the or, uh, already existing businesses in the SEZ um, announced that they will actually extend their investments. Um, quite in general, uh, of course, we saw the last year due to the COVID situation, um, yeah, slowed down uh, FDI in Myanmar, um, but uh, still. The government nearly reached their targets uh, of uh, 5.8 million and without the COVID situation uh, the um, 
actual FBI would have uh, succeeded, uh, superseded the, the target of the government by far. So we are very excited for the next years, how, how this uh, journey for Myanmar continues. And uh, especially the special economic zoom um, is, is uh, yeah, really, really a success story. And uh, we are, uh, I would say we are still uh, starting here in Myanmar and uh, will uh, um, yeah, we'll develop much further and quicker in the next years. Thank you very much, Alexander, and uh, thank you very much to everybody who participated in today's webinar and who joined us today. Um, it was a great pleasure to have you with us. Um, should any of your questions have been left un unattended due to time issues or should you come up with questions after the webinar, please be, feel free to contact us, either myself or one of the colleagues, and we will be happy to uh, come back to you um, in a bilateral way by email or in a phone call or whatever you prefer. So as always, it will be my pleasure to share the slides of today's session with you upon request. Um, and the session has been recorded. I will be happy to um, share the link uh, on our uh, ASEAN website as well as on our LinkedIn channel for you to easily find it. So once again, thank you very much to everybody and uh, stay safe and take care. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye, us from Thailand. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.